Good morning. Together with Thomas Peters, I'm going to present our work, Improve Leakage Resistant Authenticated Encryption Based on Hardware AES Coprocessors, which is a joint work with Olivier Bronchin and Charles Momin from UCL in Belgium. As a starting point, I would like to recall what leakage resistance is about. And in summary, the idea is that since countermeasures against such an attacks are very expensive, it can be interesting to avoid protecting all the parts of an implementation with equally strong countermeasures, and if possible, also to identify which part of the implementation to protect and how much. For example, in 2017, Bertie and co-author showed that if you want to encrypt and authenticate a message, it is possible to generate a fresh key with a key generation function that is DPA secure and to compute a tag with a tag generation function that is DPA secure while leaving all the rest of the computation leaking in an unbounded manner, which can of course lead to substantial performance gains. Now, if you look at the state of the art, the first question is how to implement the key generation function and the tag generation function. One solution for this purpose is to rely on masking, and this is, for example, what was proposed by Bertie and co-authors in 2019 with TEDT. The interest of this solution is that it has flexible overheads because overheads are at the implementation level. And for example, if you don't need side channel security, you will not pay anything. The negative point is that it requires expertise in order to implement masking securely. So as a step in the direction of making things easy, you have ciphers like ISAP, where the idea is to obtain DPA resistance thanks to wikiing, and therefore to rely only on SPA security. And here, for example, it is shown on the right figure that you can generate a fresh key by absorbing a fresh nonce very slowly and at the extreme bit by bit. And finally, last year at Chess, there was a paper called Retrofitting, where the idea was to use AES and SHA coprocessors by relying on the leakage resilient PRF on the left. And the observation there was that uh, even SPA security may not be trivial to obtain on low end device, and therefore hardware acceleration can help for that. And of course, if you have that, you can also make the scheme more efficient, especially if you are able to digest the nonce a bit faster. So this leads me to the outline of the talk. The first thing I'm going to do is to describe a flow in the tag verification of the retrofitting paper. Then I will discuss again the challenge of obtaining SPA security on low-end devices and especially the challenge of evaluating SPA security. Then Thomas is going to describe how we can fix the integrity flow of the retrofitting paper with a new mode of operation called LRBC2. And finally, I will discuss performance, conclusions, and other results. So I will start with the flow issue. And for this, I will start by recording what are the two main solutions to perform tag verification with leakage. The first option is to work in the direct sense, to recompute the tag toe, and to perform the verification B process of the figure. In this case, it is very important that the verification is protected against DPA. Otherwise, an adversary can use the leakage about two in order to mount forgeries. Alternatively, it has been shown by Bertie and co-authors that you can also perform an inverse-based tag verification, which is the verification A process of the figure. And in this case, you can even leak about verification in an unbounded manner. Now the problem with the retrofitting paper is that the tag generation function is based on a PRF, which is non-invertible. And as a result, the tag verification is a DPA target. And this DPA target was actually not covered by the mode's theoretical analysis. This is of course a problem because the main case study of the retrofitting paper is firmware update, which requires a secure tag verification. Let us now look at how the verification DPA works in practice. So on the right, I pasted a piece of code describing a 128-bit comparison from the retrofitting paper. 
and this is mostly uh, for 32 bit XORs between the real tag T and the candidate tags S. The basic attack an adversary can perform is the following one. The adversary can choose a garbage ciphertext. He can ask to decrypt the ciphertext with many different tag candidates S, and he will then recover the tag T thanks to the leakage of XOR T. The results of this attack on an ARM Cortex M4 are given below, and we can see that we can recover the tag with confidence with approximately 1000 traces, and we also have very similar results with the Cortex M0 and the M33. This already allows an adversary to push garbage ciphertext into a device, which could lead to kind of denial of service attacks. But we also have a more advanced attack if the adversary knows any valid message ciphertext pair. Because in this case, the adversary can also compute the random string R that was used to encrypt, and this is just the XOR between the message of, and the ciphertext. He can choose a malicious firmware M prime, and then he can compute a valid ciphertext C prime that will allow him to push this malicious firmware in the device. So we see that we have a problem with uh, the tag verification of the retrofitting paper. And before moving to the solution, I would like to come back to the main assumption of this paper, which is that we can have SPE security for its leakage resilient PRF. So for this, I pasted an example of leakage resilient PRF on the left. And what we do there is we start from the master key K. And at every stage of the PRF, we are going to encrypt a zero or one plain text, depending on the value of the nonce. And then, after 128 stages, we are going to have a fresh key K star. On the right, we have exactly the same kind of construction based on a sponge. Then, of course, this rigging can become more efficient if we are able to digest the nonce faster because if we can digest B bits per stage, then we are only going to need 128 divided by NB stages. And this leads to a trade-off because if you do that, it also leads to a SPA with two to the NB possible inputs, leading to the question, how fast can we go while maintaining uh, side channel security? And essentially this requires assessing uh, the less investigated SPA security of the construction. As a result, in the paper, we try to assess the side channel security of AES co processors, ideally in a worst case manner. We use three main steps for this purpose, which are pretty standard. First, we selected points of interest based on their signal to noise ratio. Second, we reduced dimensionality thanks to a linear discriminant analysis. And finally, we performed a template attack in a principal subspace. We perform the attacks for two to the NB inputs, and we use different levels of averaging. The results are represented by the two figures on the left for a 32-bit hardware coprocessor, on the right for a 128-bit hardware coprocessor. The x-axis is the value of NB, so the number of inputs that we can tolerate. The y-axis is the median key rank, which is the security level and the colors are for the different levels of averaging. And what we see is that uh, for the 32-bit hardware coprocessor, we really have to stick with NB equals to one if we want to uh, maintain a 100-bit security level. By contrast, for the 128-bit hardware coprocessor, we can tolerate a slightly larger NB of maybe four. What's interesting is that we get slightly different results than uh, the ones of the retrofitting paper, which suggested uh, slightly larger NV values. And the take home message here is that uh, SPA security is quite difficult to evaluate because it mostly depends on the side channel attack signal. And this is, for example, different from masking, where uh, the security will depend on the signal to noise ratio, which is easier to evaluate. In particular, the signal can be very sensitive to set up vari variations and uh, profiling methods. So the main take home message is that we should take security margins when we want to use this type of uh, constructions. 
I will now give the floor to Thomas, who will explain how we can fix the integrity flow in the retrofitting paper with a new mode of operation called LRBC2. As a bonus, he will show how we can do that by using only AES coprocessors. And this is interesting because AES coprocessors are still by far the most popular in the embedded security industry. And it will be in two parts. First, he will briefly describe how we can do the message processing with block ciphers, and then he will describe the tag generation function. Thank you, François Xavier. It is now my pleasure to present you a new one pass mode. So in the design, you can see the three steps. So on the left hand side, you have the key derivation function, which generates two n bit state. And on the right hand side, you have the tag generation function. And we will see in the next slides how we compute T. But for now, let's concentrate on the middle, the message processing part. The picture is actually a, an encryption of a message that can be split into two message blocks, M1 and M2. And at each iteration, at each processing of a message block, we have, of course, to turn the message block into a ciphertext block and to refresh the state. So from K1 and L1, we first get K2 and L2 after the first iteration. And the next state must be viewed as a hash function of the previous ciphertext block. So that means that at the end, we will have a final state, K3L3, which is the hash value of the ciphertext. Now let's take a closer look at each iteration. As you can see, we make four calls to the block cipher. That means that in practice, we will have four computation of the AES in order to process 128 bit of message. This is actually pretty efficient. Remember, we need to have a hash value at the end. That means that at each iteration, we can rely on a compression function. And due to a result from Bart Menning, we know that in order to have high security, we, when only using block cipher, call to a block cipher, we need at least three block cipher calls in order to have high security. So this is our starting point. You can see in the first iteration, all the block cipher in black come from Manning's compression function. We simply had to choose among all the possible invertible linear map, those who are fully compatible with the confidentiality of the mode. And in red, we add one more block cipher call in order to create a random n bit value in order to store it with the message block. Perfect. So we repeat this until we have processed all the message blocks and we get the final state at the end before going into the tag generation function. Perfect. Let us see now how we compute the tag T and also how we can verify the validity of the ciphertext. So the validity of the tag T. To see how we compute our tag T, let us take a look at the existing solutions. So in the picture now, A, B represent the final states. If we want to mimic the solution of the FAC paper in two years ago, we will first replace their mask block cipher with our PRF, the one that was analyzed in the previous slide by François Xavier. So if we do that, we have an X value and this X value is next used as a key of a next call of the block cipher. In encryption, this results in a tag value T. But in verification, so in a decryption carry, the re verification is not directly made on the T value. Otherwise, you have a simple DPA on that value. So you have to invert that value and the check is made on the A value. However, since we cannot rely on masking, as in the FAC paper, the X value can be revealed, can be leaked by a DPA. Indeed, the adversary can simply make distinct decryption carries with many distinct T 
and x x will be leaked so we cannot rely on that solution let's take a look and at another solution so the comparison cannot be made on t so if we invert it doesn't work so let's take a look at what happens if we make one more call to the block cipher in the forward direction then we will have a solution a la isa so that means that the check is not made on t but is made on the z value and zero is a constant it can be any other constant of course and actually this solution works except that the integrity only hold up to the birthday bound and the reason is as follows imagine that the adversary make many encryption carries from that carries he will get ciphertext with a valid t of course and with that t can simply compute itself the z value okay so we have many good z value and t value for encryption now the adversary also make decryption carries many many and he will get by dpa all the z value of that ciphertext these ciphertext for the moment are not uh, valid but by comparing the z value of the decryption carries and the encryption carries with a good chance the, we will have a collision on the t value that means that the collision will not occur on the z value but before on the t value and that means that the adversary will be able somehow to guess a good t for a ciphertext that was used only in decryption carry so he will win the integrity gain so we will have to look for another solution and the trouble actually with this um, solution so the one in the forward direction is because uh, the z value only depends on an n bit value so let us try to see what happens if we manage to compute z from two n bit value Here is what we get. Now the z value depends on both the value t and the value y in blue, which is only computed during decryption in order to verify the validity of the tag and the ciphertext. Okay, so to compute y in blue, we reuse the fmr key x once, and in the key input of the block cipher call, we simply add a constant. We show in the security proof that as long as the adversary is not able to mount a DPA on T or on X, then we have the high security that we targeted. Somehow T and Y is a state which is collision resistant. Okay, so the value Y is something that the adversary can get by DPA in decryption during the verification and the Z value as well. But we will show that it's not possible, it's not feasible for the adversary to, get, to mount a DPA on T and X. To see that, we have to go back on the final state after the, the computation of the message block. And A and B is something which is actually not random. We do not have a 2 and bit random final state. So both values, a and b, are actually the output of a smaller compression function. So that means that we can hope not to have too many collisions on that value. And this is something that we exploit in the proof. We rely on a usual technique where we define alpha as a multi-collision parameter. That means that for all the smaller compression function, we tolerate to have alpha multi-collision that means that a single value that is repeated alpha times but if we have one more collision then we abort in the game and of course the probability uh, to abort increase very very much with alpha okay so we can think that the adversary will get alpha possibilities in order to target x and so that means that the, the the block cipher to compute t it will have the same value x alpha times with distinct value of a 
actually the adversary has more than that. That is because we do not simply have a collision on B, but we might have a collision before. So we, the adversary is able to use previous collision in order to increase the amount of repetition of B with distinct A values. Okay. Fortunately, it is not possible for the adversary to have alpha cube, for instance. So this is we only have to consider what happened just before the last block cipher call that computes A and B. So with, with alpha square repetition of B, we will of course have alpha square repetition of X. And now the adversary will try to mount something which is not really a DPA. So A now is fixed. We simply have two alpha square computation with X since the value X is used twice during in, in the computation of the tag. Okay. So from a theoretical standpoint, we can have high security, really high security. But of course, the more alpha increase, the more we have to hope that the AES in practice uh, will be safe against the SPA. So in practice, if we want to have 112 bit of integrity, that means that we need an implementation of the AES where we have an SPA security that with, with uh, NB equals 7. And we saw before in the slide that is something that we do not have with the implementation. So we just have to look for a situation where the adversary does not have alpha square repetition, but only alpha. If we have alpha, everything will be better. And to get that, we simply have to add a, a simple tweaks in the design. And we had one more block cipher call here before going into the, the long PRF. And by doing this, we manage to have repetition on the W value only alpha time. And of course, with this, we have all what we want. And for the targeted bit security, we only need the SPA security of the implementation for NB equal 4. And this is something that we see that we can hope to have. So that means that with one additional block cipher at the beginning, before going into the, the, the long PRF, we have a solution that we, we can implement today. Of course, from the start, it, it would have been possible to use a second time a big PRF in order to have the high security. But of course, here we see that in the tag generation function, we simply use the long PRF and in decryption four additional calls to the block cipher. And of course, these four calls is much less than one more call to the PRF. That's all I wanted to say about O mode. Now I let Francois Xavier ending the talk. Before to conclude, let me say a few words about the performance evaluation of our schemes. The two figures at the top of the slide represent the performances of LRBC instantiated with the AES. LRAES2 is exactly the proposal that Thomas just described. LRAES3 is a two-pass variant that provides stronger confidentiality with leakage. And then we implemented the retrofitting proposal with and without SHA-256 coprocessor. We can see that for short messages on the left of the figures, LRBC is always better than the retrofitting proposal. And this is mostly because we have a more efficient tag generation function. On the right of the figures, we see that for long messages, LRBC is better if only AES coprocessors are available and the retrofitting proposal becomes better once you have a SHA-256 uh, available as well. And as expected, of course, the 128-bit coprocessor that is on the right provides better performance than the 32-bit one that is on the left. This leads me to the conclusions of the paper. First, our results recall that securing low-end embedded microcontrollers at the software level is challenging and likely to be very expensive. 
In this respect, the LRBC mode of operation aims to offer good off the shelf security whenever AES core processors are available. More precisely, LRBC2 provides optimal integrity with leakage and confidentiality with leakage in encryption only. LRBC3, that we describe in the paper, additionally provides confidentiality with leakage in two passes, and we hope that these give ready to deploy solutions for the IoT. Finally, we note that SPA security is highly non trivial to evaluate and to ensure, and therefore it leads to the open question how to obtain SPA security in software, for example using the shuffling countermeasure. Thank you for your attention.